In storytelling, continuity is everything. And that goes double for a visual medium like movies, where you also have to hide all the set equipment and sometimes even modern gadgets. But keeping all the small details consistent between shots, like what groceries a character buys or how much of their drink they've actually had, is pretty difficult. And sometimes even big, glaring errors just kind of manage to slip by, leading to ridiculous results. I'm sure we all remember the Starbucks cup in Game of Thrones, for example. So let's go ahead and be a bunch of pedantic nerds and break out our spy glasses and frame by frame pausing skills and go hunting for some small mistakes. Being an 80s Arnold Schwarzenegger movie, Commando features a lot of stuff getting wrecked, be they phone booths, cars, or hotel rooms. But one thing in a movie magically fixes itself, namely the dingy little yellow Porsche that gets wrecked when Matrix chases down Sully. Curiously, the car is completely fine when Matrix and Cindy drive away, only to go right back to being all banged up once they park somewhere else. Personally, I suspect the car was simply afraid to show weakness in the presence of a T-800. Leave any things for us? Just bodies. There was a time where people that worked in movies barely knew what video games were, much less how it actually looked when anyone played them. And you could spot stuff like incorrect controllers or sound effects all over the place, if they even played a real game at all. But the Jackie Chan film Rumble in the Bronx takes the cake, featuring a kid furiously hammering away at a Sega Game Gear with no game cartridge in it. And yet somehow the kid still looks like he's losing. Me? Yes. Thank you. Don't play with me in class. Okay. The Goonies ends with the kids doing what pretty much any kid who went on such an adventure would do, excitedly yelling about it to anybody who would listen. Everything from the pirates to sloth to the giant octopus fight. You know, the giant octopus fight that never actually happened in the movie, at least not in its theatrical release. An entire scene featuring the tentacled menace was shot and then ultimately cut, but this reference at the end wasn't removed with it. What happened out there? Were your life's in danger? The octopus was more scary. Making it sound like the kids are just kind of making things up to make their adventures seem even cooler. Kids and their imaginations, am I right? Whenever you watch a movie, it's worth keeping in mind that it was someone's job to make sure you can't tell you're looking at a set. But sometimes, something slips by, even something rather blatant. During the alien invasion film Independence Day, for instance, Jeff Goldblum at one point knocks over a bin that is clearly labeled Art Department. And no, art is not a military abbreviation for anything. Maybe Area 51 just figures that all their alien probing technology should at least look pretty. Being based on the real-life Scottish knight William Wallace, who lived in the 13th century, Braveheart is generally expected to have a certain standard for historical accuracy. Unfortunately, not only is the movie packed with minor wardrobe goofs that you may be willing to overlook, but it also features someone driving right by the battlefield in their car. It's small and very easy to miss, but sure enough, there's a white van driving right on by. Don't think we don't see it, Mel Gibson. This is one goof that you won't get away from. Scott Free. <laughs> we all know that Quentin Tarantino loves nonlinear storytelling, but there's being nonlinear, and then there's outright bending time and space at your leisure. During the famous apartment scene in Pulp Fiction, Samuel L. Jackson and John Travolta get shot at multiple times in a row, with not a single bullet actually hitting them. But they really should have known that that was going to happen, considering the resulting bullet holes were right behind them basically the entire scene. It's either that, or these guys just shoot their walls on occasion for fun or something. Frankly, they're stupid enough that I wouldn't put it past them. Check out the big brain on Brad! No matter how hairy Michael J. Fox gets in Teen Wolf, it's really just a teenage underdog basketball film in its heart. You know how it goes. Our hero manages to make the winning shot right at the very end despite all the odds being against him. He gets hailed as a hero, everyone stands up to applaud, someone realizes their fly is open and quickly has to fix it before the audience gets an eyeful they didn't ask for. Yeah, that last one somehow slipped by the editing room. Whoops. Speaking of background extras, there's this one kid in Alfred Hitchcock's North by Northwest that clearly has been going through a few too many takes for his liking. You see, gunshots are loud. Very loud. And having to hear them a ton of times in a row for a film scene can be pretty draining. At least this kid thinks so, because he can be clearly seen covering his ears a good four or five seconds before Eve St. Marie draws a gun that nobody in the place is supposed to know that she even has. Back to Tarantino. Now, we can't deny that Django is a badass. 
strutting around wearing his cool shades in 1858, taking down racist scumbags in the Wild West. In fact, he's so cool, even history itself bends to his will. You see, sunglasses may have technically been invented as far back as the 13th century, but that was in China. Sunglasses the way you know them did not start getting produced in the US until 1929. But I mean, like, if you want to be the one who steps up to Django to tell him that, by all means, be my guest. The Land of Oz may be a magical and strange place, full of witches, magical slippers, emerald cities, and flying monkeys. But there is one bit of movie magic that goes completely unexplained. Namely, the magic of how Dorothy's hair seems to be able to grow and shrink by several inches during the first meeting with the Scarecrow. He doesn't really seem to notice, but then he spends the entire scene telling us he's quite literally brainless, so that's not really too surprising. Ah uh, yes, not even this timeless Christmas classic is entirely free of goofs. When a Merry George goes to talk to Harry on the phone, he quickly discards the Christmas wreath he was carrying on his arm and puts it on a table. But not one to be just cast aside, that same Christmas wreath immediately hops right back onto his arm once the camera cuts away. Because this is a Christmas movie, dammit, and you will cradle this commercialist holiday symbol as if it was your own child if you want to see a paycheck, buster. Now, the various direct-to-video Disney sequels that got spat out during the 90s and 2000s are mostly of a, let's say, debatable quality to begin with, so a few animation goofs are kinda to be expected. But this one from Return to Jafar is downright inexcusable. Don't ask me how, but Aladdin, who is headed towards a waterfall, somehow manages to both completely miss the rock he could potentially cling to for safety and emerge from under it to do just that immediately after. In the same shot, no less. Which one is it that has the genie powers again? Him or the actual genie? We all know that Bond is a ladies' man who often gets with the sexy female agent of the week by the end of his adventures. What you probably didn't know is that the secret agent's raw sexual energy is so strong that it can heal wounds. At least that seems to be the only real explanation for why Jinx, who managed to get a cut across her stomach earlier in the movie during a sword fight, is shown to be completely smooth and unblemished when she's later playing around with the coveted diamonds. Is this that crystal healing that I've been hearing so much about? Still not quite sure. Since we're on the subject of showing off what you got, let's check out the infamous so-called most paused scene in movie history from Basic Instinct, where Sharon Stone shifts her legs in order to give the folks questioning her more than an eyeful. Being cocky enough to smoke during the interrogation and partially undressed during the entire thing, she apparently also knows magic because that cigarette she lights after the start completely disappears when she removes her jacket, only to reappear in her hand right after. Maybe the crew was too, uh, distracted to keep an eye on it. Now, while they do certainly have their fans, the Twilight movies are considered pretty infamous for a lot of reasons, even by the people who were actually in them. But it's truly something special when your film series reputation is so bad that even the costumes and makeup are trying to escape. Somehow, as the movie progresses, Jacob's ever so badass shoulder tattoo manages to slowly crawl further and further down his arm, possibly hoping to eventually slip completely out of frame if it still wants to have a hope of ever being taken seriously as a tattoo again. It never manages to get that far, though legends say that by now, it's at least reached his wrist. Okay, so we made a movie about a guy who becomes a sniper and has to live with having sneakily killed a huge amount of people. What's the quickest way we can humanize him and give the audience some extra empathy for him? Give him a baby, of course. It's supposed to be a sweet moment of bonding when Bradley Cooper holds his infant daughter in this scene from American Sniper. But there's just no escaping the fact that no matter how much it cries, and no matter how much Bradley coos and hugs it, you're still very obviously looking at a grizzled war vet holding a totally still, vaguely baby-shaped lump of plastic. You wouldn't think a movie about Roman gladiators would need any outside help to be fast-paced and exciting. I mean, come on, it's all about buff prisoners beating the crap out of each other for people's entertainment. But apparently, high-speed chariot races just weren't high-speed enough for gladiators' liking. Or at least it doesn't appear so, judging from the quite clearly visible engine that can be seen underneath one of the flipped-over chariots. Because when actual horses just don't have enough power, you gotta boost them up with a little bit of extra horsepower. 
You know, it's honestly kind of amazing that the Empire ever managed to conquer a damn thing. Aside from the ever so popular joke about stormtroopers not being able to hit the broadside of a space barn with their highly advanced laser rifles and all that, there's a rather infamous goof in A New Hope that proves that not only can any of these guys not shoot for beans, they can also barely walk through doorways. Take over. How and why this was kept in is a mystery for the ages, but we sure do appreciate it because it somehow just never stops being funny. Imagine being famous for this. Aren't you a little short for a stormtrooper? Huh? Take over. No matter how revolutionary and genre-defining John Carpenter's Halloween was, there is one fact about it that's as inescapable as Michael Myers himself on one of his killing sprees. It was made on a budget that pretty much just amounts to pocket lint in terms of Hollywood, and it shows. The otherwise creepy film is full of amusing little mistakes, particularly due to supposedly being set in Illinois, despite clearly showing a few palm trees in the background and most cars having California license plates. There's even a moment where Carpenter's own cigarette smoke manages to enter the shot. Couldn't you wait till everyone took five, man? Looks like I picked the wrong week to quit smoking. Excuse me, I'd like to ask you a few questions. I've used the word goof a lot in this video to refer to mistakes, but it's also a pretty fitting word to use when you gotta describe Jim Carrey playing Ace Ventura. Regardless of his oddities, we can't have a detective movie without a eureka moment that shows off just how smart he is. And while Ace is explaining the entire mystery in the sequel to the rest of the cast, we can see him move some chess pieces on the board. The thing is, the pieces are gone immediately after. Perhaps we should slow down just a teensy weensy bit. Nonsense, poopy pants. Food scenes are deceptively hard to do on film. You gotta make sure that everything adds up on the plate and the food doesn't magically restock itself between shots. Or for that matter, change into completely different courses like it does in Pretty Woman. Somehow, Julia Roberts' radiant charm manages to transform a croissant into a pancake. And then as she's eating that pancake, she manages to turn it into a different pancake with less bites taken out of it. This is either a mistake or proof that Julia Roberts is some kind of bakery witch that can conjure bread on the fly, or a sign that she somehow managed to eat a whole croissant and two pancakes in a matter of seconds. Maybe we should retitle the film Pretty Hungry Woman. Being a prequel to Silence of the Lambs, the third of the Hannibal films is set during the 1980s, where the famous people eater Hannibal Lecter assists in capturing a terrifying killer known as the Tooth Fairy, who also has a dragon tattoo because apparently we have a mythological creature quota to meet. What I bet you didn't know is that the Tooth Fairy apparently kills time travelers. At least that seems to be the only explanation for why the Leeds family would own a copy of the Robin Williams comedy film, Mrs. Doubtfire, which actually didn't come out until 1993. The Pirates of the Caribbean franchise is imaginative, to say the least, being full of curses, magic, and mythical creatures that only get wilder as the series goes on. Even the first film couldn't just stick with having a crew of zombie pirates either. It had to have an extra layer of weird by letting some random cowboy sneak himself aboard the Black Pearl and mingle with the pirates. Either this is a crew member who didn't keep an eye on where he was going, or this movie is part of the Cowboys vs. Aliens cinematic universe that we had no idea existed. Cowboys vs. Pirates? What a movie that would be. I believe it was W.C. Fields who was once famously quoted as saying, never work with kids or animals. It would probably be pretty boring if people actually followed that to a T, but you really gotta be careful, especially when you're dealing with an absolute mountain of muscle that is a horse. For proof, check out this otherwise majestic scene from The Last Samurai, where Katsumoto and Algren, played by Tom Cruise, arrive for a meeting before the final battle and hand their horses over to the present samurai. Suddenly, bam! Ooh, poor guy. Now, no one here is going to claim that the monster movie Anaconda is high art, but there's gotta be some standard for what you think you can get away with. Show of hands, film students. What do we do when we forget to shoot a scene of a boat sailing in reverse? That's right, we just rewind the footage in editing and completely ignore the fact that this results in a background waterfall flowing upwards. This isn't WandaVision, guys. People are actually gonna notice when you rewind stuff. In all seriousness, a lot of people put in a lot of really hard work to avoid mistakes like these, and when you're working with large crews for long hours with lots of equipment, the occasional mistake is absolutely inevitable. That doesn't mean that we're gonna laugh at them any less, though. What are we, sensible, kind, and forgiving people or something like that? Don't be crazy.